So welcome to the Privileged Man podcast. I'm excited and delighted to introduce our guest today, Erica Commissar. Erica is a clinical social worker, psychoanalyst, parent coach, and author with 30 years of experience. Erica is also a sought after psychological consultant, bringing her expertise to clinics, schools, and corporations like Goldman Sachs. Erica has written two highly influential books on parenting and is a media mainstay, appearing on CBS, ABC, Fox, and contributing to top publications like The Wall Street Journal and Washington Post. She's also a contributing editor at the Institute of Family Studies. I asked Erica on because I was enamored by her points of view on parenting. They just seemed to be from a place of common sense in what can be a confusing picture in the modern day. So it is fair to say that speaking with Erica was a special experience. She doesn't hold back and I'm grateful for her plain speaking. If you enjoy the podcast, please subscribe, give us five stars, leave a review and share episodes on your social channels. The more the podcast is listened to, the bigger the impact. There are men out there who have listened to these podcasts as a first inspiring point to taking huge steps of growth in their lives. So a big thank you for listening and more importantly, for supporting. There are links in the bio section to our website and scorecards that will give you instant insights into how balanced your life is. So please feel free to take them and receive the reports. Now, onto the main event. Erica, thank you so much for coming on the Privileged Man podcast. Absolute honor to have you here. Thank you for having me. It's an absolute pleasure. Thank you. So I am married to an American and my mother is half Canadian. So I'm quite aware of North America, North American culture. And I'm also being aware of how the North American culture affects European culture and particularly English culture. So when I saw you speaking on Instagram and speaking on YouTube and you were talking about children's mental health the way in which they are parented and what that effect is happening in America. I can see that also bleeding into British culture and how on steroids it is that this go, 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 work, work, work attitude that is now, you know, it's all about the dollar. It's all about the dollar bill as opposed to maybe a more traditional view of it's all about the kids. Can you just explain and maybe just give some an overview of what effect you're seeing of that super capitalist attitude is having on children nowadays? Well, I mean, most people who talk about children have nothing to do with children, meaning they're economists. They're sometimes social economists. And so they talk about the bottom line for governments, you know, what's good for the economy. And of course, it's good for the economy to have two working parents to get women out into the workforce as quickly as possible because their concern is not the the mental health of children. And, you know, when they say your children will be fine, they know nothing about children. They're just saying that because it is great for the economy short term to have parents go out to the workforce, both of them, and put their children in institutional care or leave them behind as early as six weeks. But the problem is that children need, they have irreducible needs, which when not met, particularly in these critical periods of brain development, which is zero to three and nine to 25, but particularly zero to three, if those irreducible needs are not met, then those children don't form, they don't develop in the same way, and then are more susceptible to break down later. Um, So what we know is that there's something called attachment security, which is formed not in the first few days, not in the first few months, but actually in the first three years of a child's life, which is that is what helps children to feel safe and secure and loved and as if the environment is a trustworthy place. And that forms the foundation of a child's personality, but it also forms the foundation for future mental health and the ability to regulate emotions and deal with adversity All that good stuff happens in the first three years. So when we drop our children, literally give birth and then just ditch them, we basically are depriving them of that foundation that they'll need for the rest of their lives. I've heard you speak like this on YouTube and on Instagram, and it must be very triggering for a lot of parents, in particular women, to hear that lack of attachment that you are talking about. Are we talking about how 
parents are creating mental health issues in children right from the get-go rather than what's really talked about which is they're on tiktok too much on their snapchat which maybe we'll get to when they're sort of nine ten and the phone epidemic if you like but it's actually starting way further back yeah well i mean you'd say social media and technology it's a funny way to say it, but it's actually an adversity for children. I would say it's an adversity for some adults too, but it's it's a kind of adversity. And and so to withstand adversity, we need a good foundation. So you could say that the children who have that really good foundation, who have very present mothers and fathers physically and emotionally. So what I say is you can be there physically and be checked out emotionally, but you cannot be there emotionally for your children if you're not there physically. So those children that have very present parents, both physically and emotionally, do better with adversity going forward. And so what that means is when things like social media or academic pressure or fears about global warming or bullying or teasing in school or all the things that children encounter, and many of which they've encountered for forever, they do better when they have that foundation than when they don't. And so that foundation is often the difference between a child who can later deal with adversity and one who cannot. Very interesting. And so a lot of modern policy seems to be about parenting. The role of motherhood, the role of fatherhood is almost politically incorrect to almost talk about nowadays. And are we becoming so politically correct that we can't even have the conversation about how important motherhood is and fatherhood is and what those two roles are. Yeah, so you're right in saying that they're both important. And we don't talk about it enough that they're both important, but they're not the same. And so in Northern European countries like Sweden and Denmark, and they want to talk about gender equality, or I should say gender neutrality, that mothers and fathers are interchangeable and fungible and exactly the same. And I say that women and men are equal in many ways, intelligence, ambition, but they're different in terms of their nurturing behaviors as it relates to their hormones, which are different. We are biologically different. I don't know why that's such a hard thing to admit. We're clearly physically different from one another. But what happens is mothers produce something called oxytocin in great amounts when they are pregnant, when they give birth, when they breastfeed, and when they nurture their young, right? Now, oxytocin is a neurotransmitter. It's a love hormone. It helps us to bond to our babies. When fathers produce it, it comes from a different parts. They, they also produce a little bit of it, not as much as mothers, and particularly fathers who stay home with their children. Fathers can produce it in smaller amounts when they nurture their children, but it comes from a different part of their brain, and it also has a different impact on their behavior. For mothers, it makes them sensitive, empathic nurturers who tune into the distress of babies, and they regulate things like fear and sadness. And fathers, oxytocin makes them more playful tactile stimulators, tickling babies, throwing, throwing them up in the air, chasing them around, playing hide and seek, encouraging resilience, exploration, and risk taking. So when fathers were given intranasal oxytocin to see if they could be more like mothers, they became like manic fathers. <laughs> It's interesting. Right. Fathers produce more of a hormone called vasopressin, which is called the protective aggressive hormone. So there was research done in the UK where fathers and mothers lay side by side in bed when the baby cried in the middle of the night. The mothers woke up because of the baby's distress. The father slept through it. But when there was rustling of leaves outside of the window, the mothers slept through it and the fathers woke up because of the predatorial risk. We're not the same. I mean, I, it's really not a biggie. This is, we're not the same, but we're both important. So mothers are required in that first three years to be home base emotionally because mothers serve a biological function, which is that they regulate children's emotions from moment to moment and keep them sort of in a state of homeostasis, keeping their emotions from going too high and too low. And so they're required for that. Fathers don't do that as well. They like stimulating babies. They like work, working babies up and they're not good at distress. They'll say, oh, you're fine if the baby falls down. It's okay. They're big on resilience and ex ex excitatory stimulation. So 
But fathers, because they help with play, they help with separation. So if fathers aren't around, and there's a lot of single mothers by choice now who have babies on their own, those babies are having trouble separating. So fathers later in development are very important for separation, which is of equal importance to attachment. So fathers and mothers are both important. Also, fathers support mothers. And this is really important that today we have a problem because fathers don't know how important their role is to support mothers to stay home with their children in those early days because we've all been fed uh, a myth that mothering doesn't matter and that making money matters and materialism matters and going back to work matters. And so fathers buy into this. And then when their wives have a transformative moment and want to stay home with the baby, the fathers say, but you promised to go back to work. Our mortgage depends on it, our card. So these are things that we should be discussing before we have babies. Right. And that's why I wanted to bring this to the conversation, because I, I think there's just that conversation, one, isn't being had, but two, the expectations of men, of their women, has been somewhat warped, I feel, because there cannot be anything more important than bringing a child into the world. It's so odd to say that that is politically incorrect now, but it or it is almost politically incorrect to say that actually for these three years or for these couple of years, this child is actually what really, really matters. Well, I would say that, you know, two strange bedfellows, the feminist movement and governments collude together to profligate a myth that children are like self-cleaning ovens and that they just take care of themselves and they'll be fine. And none of which is true, right? So governments have an investment in getting people, as many people into the economy as possible. And the feminist movement from its inception went too far. It did a good thing. It said women have, you know, are equal in intelligence and should have the ability to choose careers. And sure, and that's all true. And I'm one of the benef beneficiaries of that, right, of my generation. What it didn't say is that children are still the most important things in our lives if we choose to have them. We don't have to have them, you know, by the way, you can have a very fulfilling life as a man, as a woman, as a couple without having children. You can lead a very happy, narcissistically pleasing life. But if you have children, you have a responsibility to raise them in a healthy way, to be there for them physically and emotionally. And we're not talking about that too, that having children is not the ideal. It's caring for children. Don't have children if you don't want to care for them. That's what Penelope Leach said 30 years ago. So it's very interesting, isn't it? This conversation can also be wrapped up in such general statements, can't it? There is a timing for when the kids are right to come away, I guess. I'd like you to talk more about this. The timing of when it is okay for when it's good for them to socialize and when it is great for, I guess, the mothers to go back to full-time work and the fathers, whatever way it needs to be described. So the first three years are a critical period of brain development because by the age of three, 85% of the right or social emotional brain is developed, most of it. And it's very susceptible, the brain at that point in that first three-year period, to the environment, that the environment is safe, secure, reassuring, emotionally regulating, stress buffering. And that means that having your attachment security person there in those first three years is what a child needs, not group socialization, also a myth. In America, 50 years ago, preschools didn't start until three years of age. They went from three to five. And at three, you were only sending your child three days a week for two hours a day. It was just an introduction to drop off, kind of a drop off separation kind of experience. And then by four, you were spending four hours, maybe five hours a day in preparing for kindergarten. That was 50 years ago. It's not so long ago. What happened is that women wanted to go into the workforce and had to, I guess, financially as well, and more and more. And so supply and demand, preschools, or we used to call them nursery schools, 
who said they would never take a child under the age of three because it wasn't good for children, started taking children as young as 14 months and calling it preschool, right? Which is what's happening in Sweden and Denmark and all these countries which depend on as many people in the economy as possible, right? So, and this was wrong. This was not something that was done uh, on behalf of children and the health of children. It was done for grownups. It was done for economics reasons. And it did great damage to children because first it called a place that you send your children at 14 months school when it's not, it's institutional daycare. And parents leave their children in America as early as six weeks of age in institutional daycare which is institutional care. As many hours as 10, 12 hours a day, it's like sending your child to an orphanage during the day. When in that first three years, what they need is the presence of that attachment security person who's going to give them a sense of safety and security so they can explore the world, so they can take risks, so they can learn to play, and look back and see you're there and continue to play, right? In the playground, they look at you and they come and get you, give a, get a hug from you and then they go off again. That three-year period is repeat reassurance, repeat reassurance, repeat reassurance, repeat reassurance. That's the point of it. And no one is educating parents that that's the, I got an email the other day saying, I feel like our public health system has lied to us, has let us down. And I would agree with that. It feels like that. It feels as though it's almost sort of slowly intertwined to the point now where it's like, as you say earlier, like the mortgage depends on it. Everything's become so expensive because there's so much more money because there are two very strong incomes. And then if that one is taken away, it's like, well, it's, we can't do this. We can't do this lifestyle anymore. And then it's like that tangle with that internal conflict of, well, I've got a child now, but also I've got all of these obligations. And if we want our child to have an amazing, i.e. keeping up with the Joneses childhood, well, we've got to keep the house and we've got to keep the car and we've got to take that holiday. And so I can see why it's just, it's a very, very painful transition now compared to, as you say, 40, 50 years ago, I have a feeling that it wasn't as necessary and society didn't see it as a norm. So there wasn't probably the level of shame that you know, I talk about to my wife, how in America particularly, there's this sort of almost shame of being a, a stay-at-home mum, right? Like it's sort of, it's what the minority do now as opposed to the majority. Well, I mean, I think it's also how we define success and happiness. If we define success and happiness as, you know, that we need to own a home sooner, that we need to have the car sooner, that we need to take certain vacations. You know, again, it is a timing issue. You know, you can do everything in life and probably, you know, have a lot of things in life, just not all at the same time and probably not at the time that you're raising young children in an economy that demands two people working. It takes planning and it takes sacrifice. And, you know, I don't think we like to think about sacrifice today. I don't think we like to think about discomfort. I think that's why we have all this medication to make us feel less uncomfortable. You know, discomfort helps us to grow. Not all discomfort is bad for us. Um, and certainly sacrifice helps us to appreciate what's, what's really important, you know. So I think we have generations that are focusing on the wrong things, the wrong value system. All that doesn't matter. You know, the house, the car, the vacations, the school, none of that matters if your children are not mentally well. Mm. So coming to perhaps the listeners who have kids who are in their teens and they're recognizing, looking back and thinking, okay, well, actually this this is kind of resonating. What now? What do, they, what do you say to parents who recognize that they actually, looking back, they probably didn't do it the way that they wanted to do it and it's having consequences? So I wrote two books. And the reason I wrote two books, the first book is called Being There, Why Prioritizing Motherhood in the First Three Years Matters. But it should be read by fathers because fathers need to understand. It talks a lot about fathers in the book, 
but that's the the title they gave it. The, the original title of that book that I gave it was The Lost Instinct, and they wanted it to be being there. So it's called Being There. The second book I wrote is called Chicken Little, The Sky Isn't Falling, Raising Resilient Adolescents in the New Age of Anxiety. But the title of that book originally that I picked was Second Chances. Mm. Beautiful. Because you have a second window of critical brain development. So think of the first window, zero to three, as a period of neurogenesis. That means the baby's right brain is growing like a garden in England. Everybody has a garden. Think about if you never prune your garden, it just overgrows, right? That's what's happening. And if you raise them right, if you're present, if you are there to help regulate their emotions and buffer them from stress and be there when they're in distress, then their garden overgrows. And then at 9 to 25, which is adolescence, because we know now that adolescence starts earlier and ends later, 9 to 25, good long period, is the time of pruning the garden. And it's a very important period, also as almost as important as the first period, and also has a lot of similar elements to it. And it's a period where the environment, once again, has a critical influence on the brain's development, and you're the environment as the parents. Other things are the environment too, school, friends, activities. So there are other things that become part of their environment, whereas zero to three, tag, you're it, you're the environment, you're their entire universe. Nine to 25, you're a very important piece of their environment, which means that you once again have the ability to help them to learn to regulate their emotions and deal with adversity in the future. But you have to be there. So interestingly, at nine to 25, parents say, ah, oh, I can go back to work full, full time. I can start traveling for work again. I can go out at night. My kids are fine. They, no, just like, no, <laughs> it's just not right. Yes, of course, you can go out at night once a week on a date night and you can, well, you can go back to work. But if you are not present when they get home from school, if you are not present when they're doing their homework, if you're not present when they're going to sleep, uh, when they wake up in the morning, what we call the transitional periods, you lose your opportunity to help regulate their emotions. And their emotions need regulating in adolescence because that pruning period means that they're very unstable. Their emotions are very unstable. The threat sensing parts of their brain, the reward centers of their brain, what we call the ventral striatum and the amygdala are growing at an enormous rate while the prefrontal cortex or the emotional regulating part of the brain has not caught up and doesn't catch up till about 25, in young men, 28. So what that means is you are the external emotional regulator for your children from 9 to 25. Think about if your kidneys fail and you go get kidney dialysis. So that's mm -hmm. what we are. We are like the kidney dialysis machine for them until their prefrontal cortex catches up. That means in adolescence, they're more prone to addiction, to uh, sensitivity to rejection and sensitivity to criticism, which social media amplifies. So all of these things make that child very unstable from nine to 25. And if we're not there enough of the time, I mean, you know, kids are in school from 8.30 in the morning until usually four in the afternoon in America. That gives you a good long period as a mother or a father to work. But somebody's got to be there when they get home from school. A very interesting. It brings up quite a lot for me, particularly. Uh, you know, I've, I've talked previously on this podcast about my experience of boarding school, which was not an ab abusive experience, but as one of our guests called it, it was normalized neglect. That's exactly and what it is. Oh, I'm so glad somebody has. Who said that? Because I talked about it. Yeah, it's in episode seven, a guy called Nick Duffel. Yeah, it's an, ex it's an extraordinary podcast, which has had uh, a, a deep impact. I know it has had a deep impact because I've had a lot of review on it, on a, people going, well, I've been thinking for 40 years, what's wrong with me? Well, everybody's uh, so afraid to criticize the British system because it's traditional. But in fact, that's one tradition that probably should be looked at very carefully because it has created a tradition in the British culture of what we call schizoid defenses, which is sh sh basically cutting off from emotion. Yes. So, I mean, very interestingly, I had a guy called Sir Andrew Strauss, who's the captain of or the ex-captain of England cricket, very famous guy, is very well loved, uh, lost his wife very sadly in 2018 and, and was left with to bring up his two boys 
But he said very articulately that whilst boarding school gave him a huge amount of privilege in, in, within his cricket career, it taught him to be a very good professional sportsman because it allowed him to close down emotionally. What he said, which is in part necessary to perform right at the top in his own words, in his own experience. But he also said it on the flip side in the real world and dealing with the illness of his wife, it acted in a very adverse effect, negative effect for him. So it is something that particularly in this culture, don't want to rock the institutions too much. I've asked several people from boarding school institutions to come onto the podcast and talk, and none of them will. And I'm saying, come and put the case forward for what has changed. There's a lot of views about what boarding school used to be like in the 50s, the 60s, 70s, 80s, when you get locked away for three months and not see your parents from term. Institutional term. daycare for adolescents. Right. And I've asked them to come forward and say, look, you know, obviously things have changed. There's now at my old school, there's a, a wellness team, I think, of 15 people. I mean, we didn't even have a counsellor back in, and that's just in the 90s. So, you know, with 750 students, not even one counsellor, it was extraordinary. So anyway, coming back to your, your sense of the adolescence between 9 and 25, that really rings true for me because I was a boy until I was reached 30, trapped in a man's body, having really very little idea of who I was. But I was very lucky and very fortunate to have a very loving mother who I was with in my early childhood from zero to three. But I was very lost without them for a few years, particularly when I started boarding around the age of 10. And I'm sure many men listening to this will also understand that feeling of feeling lost. But what I'm seeing now is a lot of those men waking up to actually what happened and actually admitting that it wasn't right and it wasn't healthy and actually treating their children very differently. There's obviously lots of different ways in, in terms of doing that. And that, I think, by older generations can be seen as being quite soft and that there isn't enough, I guess, discipline and the kids of today aren't resilient enough. What do you say to that? There's a rabbi on the internet. I wish I could remember his name. I'm Jewish. My husband sent me this, you know, this clip on Instagram, I think it is. And he's sort of one of these very wise old rabbis. And he said, you know, the problem today, and I thought this was really good. The problem today is that children don't see very good role models in their parents to be parents, meaning they don't see a model of who they want to be. So they just don't grow up because they don't see their parents as being very grown up. In their parents, they don't find those role models of what's so joyful about being a mother and a father and an adult. And they don't see the joy in adulthood. And there's a reason for that, because development is a funny thing. It takes its pound of flesh. If we don't get what we need early on, we don't forward in development or parts of us forward in development, but parts of us stay very regressed and we don't fully develop as a person. So you have a lot of 40, 50, 60 year olds even walking around who didn't fully develop inside, uh, who remain in a narcissistic state that that's an adolescent state. So narcissism is a developmental state that you're supposed to go through in adolescence, but you're supposed to come out of it and into adulthood. But if you don't, continue to forward in development, then you remain in a regressed state. So it means that children aren't seeing adults who are really sort of modeling adulthood and modeling the joy of adulthood and the joy of parenthood, right? So mothers who seem resentful and don't want to be with children and fathers who really feel frustrated and angry and don't really want to be parents and would rather be off skiing or or doing whatever they they want to do for themselves, going out with their friends. And so they're not really seeing adult role models. And again, it's not the parent's fault because trauma keeps us in a regressed state. If we don't get, the best example I can always use is if you go to a restaurant and they serve you just a tiny bit of food you wait at the table for the rest of the food to come because you're still hungry. You don't leave the table until you get fed, 
Whereas if you have a good meal and you get fed, you get up from the meal, you go, that was really good, and you leave the restaurant. Mm. Most adults today have never left the restaurant. Yeah, I totally see that. It's called generational but. expression, the generational expression of neglect, the generational expression of attachment disorders. People, adults come to me and say, I think I have an attachment disorder. And I say, you might, because attachment disorders, if you had one as a child, it doesn't go away unless you get treatment, right? So we know that attachment disorders, if you have an attachment disorder at the end of 12 months, the longitudinal studies show you have an attachment disorder 20 years later, 30 years later, 40 years later, if you don't get help. Can you just explain to listeners what you mean by attachment disorder? How does it show up? So there are three types of attachment disorders that have been identified that we think about as clinicians, right? So a securely attached child, when their parent goes away, their, their mother or their father, whoever is their primary attachment figure, it's usually the mother. When their mother goes away and the mother comes back, that child welcomes the mother is joyful and can reconnect with the mother rather quickly, right? That's what healthy attachment security looks like, that they can deal with small gaps in the mother's absence. And, you know, when the mother returns, there's joy and they can reconnect. But an avoidant attachment disorder is when the mother has been gone too long, where the mother is physically there, but emotionally not present, distracted, depressed, you know, resentful, that baby turns away. That baby looks away, turns away, turns toward other people in what we call indiscriminate attachment, will attach to anybody else other than the nanny, other adults in the room, but will turn away from the mother. And the, the voice of the child sounds something like this, well, you weren't there for me when I needed you, and I can't rely on you. I don't trust you. And the baby turns away. That leads to depression later in life. It correlates with depression. It correlates with the inability to form attachments to friends and intimate others. Okay. An ambivalent attachment disorder is a different coping mechanism. Just think of it as different coping, different strategies, right? The ambivalent attachment disorder is when a baby, the mother comes back and the baby goes, oh my God, I got to cling to my mother like a rhesus monkey, right? I got to cling to my mother because she's going to leave again. And that baby is cries and is impossible to detach from you once really they are very fearful that you're going to leave again and they hold on to you for life itself and can't let you out of their sight. And those babies, that correlates with anxiety later on. Um, and, and those babies often become very anxious mothers themselves. Lastly, the third attachment disorder, which is the hardest to treat and probably the most uh, sort of destructive to a person is when a baby doesn't have a strategy. So we say it's better to have a strategy than not to have a strategy. And those babies develop what's called a disorganized attachment disorder, which is they don't have one strategy. They cycle through many strategies. They go from clinging to turning away to getting angry and slapping the mother, to clinging, to turning away. It's like not having one strategy. And that's correlated with personality disorders like borderline personality disorder. Absolutely fascinating. I'm sure that many people listening can either see that in themselves or see that in their children as painful as that is. When the awareness comes, there is, it's time for action. It's time to do so. It's time for healing. As I, I always say, it's never too late to heal. Where there's life, there's hope. Right. <laughs> My own mother is now 73 and she is continuing her own personal development. And I'm 42. It's still healing because each time she does, she can hold space better. She can listen better. She can just be a much more positive influence on my life. And so when people are in their like 40s and 50s and they're saying, oh, well, probably saying to themselves, oh, well, it's not much I can do about that. That all happened to me. And as a result, I'm just going to stick with it. Or as Churchill said, just keep buggering on. What would you say to them? Get Come to this awareness of, crikey, I didn't actually have a very functional childhood. Where do I go next with it? What shall I do? What's the treatment? Find a therapist who is not a cognitive behavioral therapist. Really important. 
cognitive behavioral therapy has become a big thing in America, but it's basically just symptom relief. You find a therapist who has what we call a psychodynamic background and maybe some training with attachment theory, and but basically a psychoanalyst or someone who's trained psychodynamically. They don't have to be a psychoanalyst. They can be a psychotherapist. There are really good psychotherapy institutes in the UK, in America, that teach therapists in a psychodynamic fashion. What that means essentially is, it's a technical term to say, they are trained to understand not just how to treat the symptoms of a person, but to talk about the origins of those symptoms and the relational origins of those symptoms. So you can get to the root of the problem and the disturbance at a very sort of basic level, at a fundamental level. Otherwise, you're just what I call cutting the grass. Interesting. So I talk about that a lot lately about the fact that we live in a symptom-based society that deals with symptoms through pills rather than actually deepening our understanding of ourselves by going to the problem and working out what what the core destructive beliefs that are really holding us back. Most people need talk therapy and not medication. A very small percentage of people really need medication, but a very large percentage of people are on medication because, again, The way I would describe it is that it's only by understanding where we come from that we know where we're going. And if you go to a psychiatrist, they're trained, majority of them are only trained to give pills. They're not trained to really help you understand the origins of things. They're pain relievers is what psychiatrists are. And unless you really are suicidal, unless you are really having extreme panic attacks, unless you're not functional and you can't get out of bed. Generally, talk therapy is the best route, right? And not cognitive behavioral therapy, right? So talk therapy that helps you to understand what's at the cause, the root cause of these feelings that you have of having of depression, of anxiety. Um, And sometimes medication is used in the very beginning as a bridge, but it shouldn't be used to replace understanding. Sure. That's really what worked for me to come out of my funk, if you like, when I was in my early 30s, because I suddenly realized that speaking out all these things that I had pushed down and compressed and depressed it from my childhood and I guess from my early adulthood life as well, as you rightfully say, adolescence going through to late 20s, that was definitely right for me. <laughs> came out in these behaviors that I didn't really understand. I didn't really feel like myself. And so when I started talking about it, particularly in groups, and then seeing other people talking about their truth or how they really felt, it gave me more permission to go even deeper. And the deeper I went and the more I shared, the more authentic I felt and the more part of this world that I felt, I really didn't feel part of this, this world coming into adulthood, I was just like, I feel like a bit of an outsider here. I reckon there was lots to that, but I'm sure a lot of people are walking around fairly lost without that attached guidance from healthy parents. Yeah, because at Um, the end of three years, what happens is we internalize that security. So we, as you say, we walk around with the voices in our head of that reassuring, loving, nurturing mother and father. We walk around with those voices, but if we didn't have that, then we often walk around, you know, we we tend to either idealize or denigrate the voices. So meaning we amplify the negative and we amplify the positive. So if we didn't have a very positive experience of trusting our environment in the first three years, we often amplify the negative in our minds. And unfortunately, it, it's sort of like a, a stone that gathers moss. It amplifies over time. And by the time we're young adults and adolescents, those voices are very critical indeed. Very interesting. I mean, talking of those voices and hearing outside influences, obviously like smartphones, social media, I mean, the hours that kids are spending on them nowadays is just extraordinary. But what effect is this actually having on children and where do you see there being any kind of hope around the use of them for i mean for society and and for people's mental health i mean really can mental health globally improve if we're just becoming more and more digital 
Well, I mean, not all technology is bad. So we know that. But what technology has done is, it. first of all, most technology, the phone, social media, what it does is, is for at least for adolescents, it stimulates the reward centers of the brain at a time when you don't want to overactivate or overstimulate those parts of the brain because the brain is very susceptible to things like addiction. Because the kids, there's a, another coll- a colleague of mine named uh, Dan Siegel who wrote a book and he talks about it's, it's the time of all gas and no brakes. So there's no impulse control, very little. There's very little ability to regulate desire and to regulate the reward center. And so, you know, what it does is it overactivates the reward centers of the brain. So that's a problem, right? The other problem is that it overactivates the threat sensing parts of the brain. So all of that sort of all those screen images and all of that comparison culture and all of that perfectionism, what it does is it gets the the amygdala going, the threat sensing part of the brain, which also is not regulated yet. And so it, it leads to things like hypersensitivity to comparison, hypersensitivity to rejection, hypersensitivity to feeling less than. And so that's not good, particularly for teenage girls. So basically what it's done is, I mean, who am I to say that it was designed in a way to um, to hyperstimulate the adolescent brain in a way that causes, has very negative impacts, right? So I'm not going to it's not conspiracy theory to say that I think once they figured out that it was addictive, they were like, wow, this is a business. We can get more people to sign on to this. And I think that's what it does. I don't think it's really, they're, they're in business. They're not in the business of health of our children and adolescents. I mean, I think they're being forced to be in that business now where they have to think about regulating. And, but in the past, it's, uh, I think it's amplified. Social media and technology has amplified things in the the adolescent brain that are really shouldn't be amplified. So what I'm hearing is it just comes back to the importance of parenting attachment early on, the level of security that each child has and to not get influenced or to have that security at home so that there doesn't need to be another world found and one which can be particularly dark if a certain routes are taken. Yeah. I mean, I suppose you could say that Technology, and particularly social media, has become sort of the wild west of freedom for children and adolescents. But freedom without responsibility leads to anarchy and chaos. And that's what's happening. So what does it mean? What's the solution is to regulate and put rules around and restrictions around. And now there are phones that you can buy for your children. No adolescent under the age of 15 or 16 should be on social media. And so there are phones that are designed by companies like Google that are phones for children that are merely flip phones or are not smartphones, but are phones that you can play a simple game on on the bus ride home, but nothing more and some basic texting. So you can text your mom that I'm going to be 15 minutes late. The bus is running 15 minutes late or mom, you know, the soccer team is going to be late. You have to pick me up, but that's it. And parents are afraid to buy these for their kids because their kids say, well, my, you know, my friends all have the smartphone and I have to have it too. And you have to, as a parent, you have to be a parent. I think you said it earlier. You are not going to be their friend. You're not, you cannot be their friend and be their parent. These are different roles. So your, your kids aren't always going to like the rules that you set. They're not always going to want to, like, they're not always going to be happy with you. Something's gotten lost in translation that sometimes we need to set limits and restrict things that we think are bad for them. And they're not going to be happy with us. This seems to be such a long and drawn out. The children's mental health and mental health in general is so not physically seen as physical health and physical health deteriorating as much. So this seems to be something that is not put on the urgent list. And it's also not discussed as listen to the science, because as you say, there is clear science to say that it is not good for children to be on screens. But yet there is no public health inquiry about it. There is no public health direction. don't know about the States, but there certainly isn't over here. 
you know, these things are clearly going to torture some. And I feel that that sense of, and that listening to the science is very, they pick which parts it, they want to listen to the science about, right? But physical health, they clearly do. Mental health, it doesn't seem as though we're there yet. Well, I mean, I think it means having to make some major societal changes. It's not just social media. It has to do with how we raise our children. I think Gabor Mate often says, he's like, he had, he's similar to me. He says, it's how we raise our children and the toxic environment in which we raise our children. So, and those two things can be changed. That's the crazy thing. We can reorient ourselves to raising our own children again. We can restrict social media. We can create laws, but it means restricting freedom. And we're so big now on freedom, freedom to be who you are, to say anything. I mean, we see how that's working out. Even the idea that we can say anything hateful in the world on social media publicly, and it's okay because that's freedom of speech. So somehow we got sort of the wrong memo that all freedoms shouldn't be restricted, that freedom is the ultimate goal. And no, just no. I mean, think about what parenting is. Can you imagine if we just let our kids do whatever the hell they want? They'd be crazy kids. That's something to do with how we have come to perceive of freedom as being the idol. Um, yeah. If you were to magically be put in the White House, what was one thing that you would do policy-wise to flip the trajectory we're on, both in America and I guess the world, and the way in which we are raising our children? Well, first I would give a full year of paid maternity leave and an additional two years of partial paid leave and the ability to work part-time. Because I know that we could never get three years. Otherwise, I, like Hungary, would give three years of paid maternity leave. <laughs> That's what I'd really like to do. And then I would restrict social media, make it so restrictive to anyone under the age of 15 that parents would be held responsible if their children were on social media. That it would even maybe make a law that it was illegal to have children under the age of 15 on social media. I could think of many other things, but those would be the first two things I would do. I guess I would also start an educational campaign about zero to three, but not just like the zero to three foundation, which just says it's important. It's such an important. I would actually say that you have to be there physically and emotionally as much as possible if you want to raise healthy kids. And it's a public health crisis that we have really not educated people about this. Thank you so much. It was super interesting. Thank you for coming on. Thank you for having me. So thank you for tuning into the Privileged Man podcast. If you feel a resonance with our message and are keen to join a globally connected community of men committed to nurturing and elevating their mental wealth, I invite you to explore further. Visit our website, theprivilegedman.com, where you'll find enriching testimonials of men who have become a part of this empowering movement. Remember the journey to becoming a privileged man, a truly privileged man, one with elevated mental wealth, starts with your next action step. And that step could be just a click away. Thank you again for your time. And I'm looking forward to having you with us in our next episode.